guys, welcome to Hip Hughes History. In the next few minutes, we're going to be taking a look at the life of John Brown, one badass American. And at the end of the lecture, maybe you can decide whether you think he's a martyr or a terrorist, and give me some recommendations of other badass Americans you'd like to see a video about. But right now, it doesn't matter who you are, whether you're a kid in high school, middle school, college, or cray cray on the internet, we're about to serve up some learning. So sit down and giddy up for that. So stupid. I have no Wi-Fi. I'm going to have to call Cliff. Cliff from That Was History. Hello? Hey, is this Cliff? Yeah, man, this is Cliff. Maybe you don't know this, but I wear Google glasses. Like, I literally Google everything as I lecture. And my Wi-Fi is out. This is so stupid. You can't tell anybody this, brother. I need to ask you some questions. All right. About John Brown. You know John Brown, badass John Brown? Yeah, yeah, I'm familiar with John Brown. So I know there's a vocabulary word about, like, from uh, the Kansas-Nebraska Act that came out of the Compromise of 1850, like, where they vote in the states. It's like two words. You don't know the two words. Come on. Come on. Come on. Okay, okay, fine, fine. I'll quit picking on you. It's popular sovereignty. You remember that one? Sovereignty. S-O-V-R. Uh, I'll just spell check it later. All right, the next one. It was like something about Kansas, like zombie Kansas. You're close. You're definitely close. But it was, in fact, bloody Kansas. Ah, my bloody Kansas. I've been watching Walking Dead a lot, so I think that's what happened there. Ah, such a good show. <laughs> The best thing about the John Brown story is about how he wins at the end and he lives like to a ripe, ripe old age. I love that part. Keith, he doesn't win. He doesn't win. What do you mean, he loses? Do you remember? He, get, he, gets, he gets executed. Come on now. Boy, wow, what a, what a misery to end on. Yeah. Yo, you rock, man. All I can do is wish you the happiest of New Year. And, oh man, I'm going to give your channel a shout out as loud as I can. I'm going to be like, that was history! Yeah, that's awesome. Well, I appreciate the shout out and I, I wish you the best of luck in the new year because from the sounds of it, it looks like you got some research to do in case the internet goes out again. Oh, that one stung, that one stung. All right, man, we'll, we'll, we'll check up on each other on Twitters or the Tweeters or the Facebooks or something like that. I'll talk to you soon, okay, brother? All right, great. All right, okay, we'll talk to you later. Bye-bye. See ya. All right, a little bit of John Brown, and I don't want to make this like a bio video. You can go watch that somewhere else. There's probably a button there below. But certainly, um, knowing the very basics, John Brown was born in 1800. His family moved around a lot. He had a big family. He lived in Connecticut and Ohio, Pennsylvania, New York, Massachusetts. He really kind of made the rounds. He got married at a very uh, early age. He was actually married twice. He ended up having, I think, 20 children. And uh, early in his youth, when he was about 16, he wanted to grow up and be a Congregationalist minister. He didn't have the money to go to college, and he eventually fell into his father's business, which I believe was tannery, and he later got into the wool business, but he wasn't a business dynamo, and he had a lot of problems going bankrupt. But always in the back of his mind was abolitionism. Um, from an early age, he was taught with his religious beliefs in the Bible that this was a sin on planet Earth. I think that was always kind of in his path. So in 1837, for the first time, John Brown gets pushed towards what I would call militancy, this idea that it's going to take violence to end and abolish slavery. And that's when, in 1837, Elijah Lovejoy, who is an abolitionist white guy, runs an abolitionist newspaper in Alton, Illinois, is murdered. His press is burned down, and these kind of pro-slavery forces from Missouri end up killing him. And John Brown, for the first time, starts kind of writing in his journals about really the need for some type of uh, conflict, some type of militant action in order to really solve what he sees as the sin of humankind, which is slavery. And then the next year I'm going to bring up is 1846, because in 1846, John Brown moved around a lot. Um, he wasn't, like I said before, the best businessman in the world. So he ends up moving around a lot. He ends up landing in Springfield, Massachusetts, uh, running, I believe, a wool commission. But in Springfield, you have really one of the most radicalized towns in the United States, cities in the United States. It is abolitionist from head to toe. Um, a few years before, the Sanford Street Free Church was formed. Um, Sojourner Truth spoke there. Frederick Douglass spoke there. William Lloyd Garrison. Um, you have all of the big names 
Republicans and abolitionists in that city, including politicians who are radical Republicans or going to be radical Republicans. And really, he begins kind of his life kind of swirling around radical abolitionists um, kind of ideas. And of course, in 1850, with the Compromise of 1850, we see the admittance of California into the Union. And the trade-off, of course, is the Fugitive Slave Act. And that's Fugitive Slave Act that is going to further uh, radicalize John Brown. Because in a sense, what this means is slave catchers are going to be able to enter the North and are going to be able to catch escape property slaves and drag them back legally into the South. And John Brown forms a group. It's called the League of uh, Gileadites. And I'm a bad mispronouncer. It comes out of biblical terms of basically being like the defenders against kind of, you know, evil forces. So the next big event for John Brown is going to be around 1855. In 1854, the Kansas-Nebraska Act adopts what the uh, Compromise of 1850 adopted in terms of solving the problem of slavery in the New Territories with popular sovereignty, meaning that we're going to vote on slavery. And Kansas is preparing to vote on slavery. So a couple of John Brown's sons had lived in Kansas, and he was kind of uh, given the communication that these pro-slavery forces, which were called border ruffians, because many of them came across from the border of Missouri, these kind of pro-slavery forces. A lot of them weren't even slave owners. A lot of these guys were slave catchers, and they saw their business in this, and uh, they didn't want Kansas going free. So they're basically invading, you know, kind of uh, free soil camps and killing people. And John Brown is worried about the safety of his kids. So he ends up hiking out to Kansas. And this becomes the incident known as Bloody Kansas. There's actually a couple things that occur. In 1856, May 1856 is a huge year for John Brown. So in May 1856, we have the Charles Sumner incident. Uh, Charles Sumner had given a speech on the floor of the Senate called Crimes Against Kansas. And in that speech, he basically makes an accusation against the senator from uh, South Carolina, Senator Butler. And he basically calls him a pimp for slavery, that he is... Uh, you know, uh, uh, sleeping with the harlot of slavery. It's kind of like a sexual innuendo of uh, kind of <laughs> the cruelty of slavery. And uh, his nephew, who's a house member, his name was Preston Brooks, takes mad offense to this. And he ends up taking his cane and he marches in to Massachusetts Senator Charles Sumner's office and he basically beats him to half death. Uh, this put Charles Sumner out of commission for three years, and he lived the rest of his life in pain because of this incident. But this really makes John Brown go mad. He sees that violence is being used by their side. Violence is being used in their side against uh, Charles Sumner. Violence is being used in Kansas when these pro-slavery forces or these border, border ruffians are killing people. And at the end of May, we have the Potawatomi Massacre. And this basically is John Brown for the first time fighting back. John Brown, in his militancy, had begun to kind of conspire, first with a couple English mercenaries, but also with some of the economic merchants that he had connected with in Springfield, Massachusetts. And he begins trying to put together basically an army. And this army, or whatever you want to call it, is ending up now in Kansas and is defending the lives of these free soilers. And at the end of May, they ended up kind of uh, hacking to death five pro-slavery forces in Potawatomi. And this becomes the Potawatomi Massacre. And this is really what launches us into bloody Kansas. And then um, basically from May, uh, June, July, the summer of 1856, Kansas is a battleground, a battleground between northern forces and southern forces. It's like a mini civil war. All right, let's check out the next phase of John Brown's radicalization. <laughs> So John Brown's plan is badass. It's badass not because it's well executed. It's badass because of its craziness. John Brown's plan is to invade Harper's Ferry, the armory. Right? He's going to take his guys, he's going to take over the guns, he's going to give the guns to the slaves, the slaves are going to rip through the south, freeing all of the other slaves. It's a utopian plan that's going to go nowhere. John Brown wanted 4,500 guys, right? He's gathering in uh, Harper's Ferry, it's uh, uh, October 1859. He gets 21 dudes. This is why he's badass. 
He takes his 21 dudes and he uses 18 of them to barge into Harper's Ferry and he takes it over. He takes it over, he stops a train, they end up shooting somebody, but he lets the train go on who then informs Washington, who then sends Robert E. Lee with the U.S. Marines to go capture John Brown. John Brown doesn't have a fighting chance. John Brown um, is arrested, he's beaten, he's given the death penalty. And what's interesting is the trial was held in the Commonwealth of Virginia because they didn't want the feds having their hands on John Brown because they were afraid of things like presidential pardons. On December 2nd, 1859, uh, the Commonwealth of Virginia in Jefferson County, Charlestown, puts John Brown to death. John Brown writes in his journal the day that he dies, very foretelling words. I, John Brown, am now quite certain that the crimes of this guilty land will never be purged away but with blood. I mean, the Civil War, guys, is only like a year and a half away. A Stonewall Jackson um, is in charge of all the troops that line the streets and the garrison to make sure that nobody uh, tries an escape kind of thing with John Brown. Um, you have guys like John Wilkes Booth that uh, stole a uniform to get in there to watch the execution, and Walt Whitman, who writes poetry as he watches the execution. Later down the road, John Brown, after he dies, will become a martyr. John Brown's body. I'm not going to sing, but I know you've heard the words here. Listen. That's the song of a martyr. Those are the words that are going to kind of rise the fires of abolitionism and really create tension between the North and the South that we haven't seen before. And now the South, because of this, is going to build up their own armed forces because they are fearful of other abolitionist attacks. They see Republicanism and John Brown as one. They see Lincoln and John Brown as one, even though John Brown was called crazy by Abraham Lincoln because this is a guy that is pushing the nation into war and Lincoln doesn't want to go to war. And when Lincoln is elected, it doesn't matter because the South sees John Brown instead of Abraham Lincoln and they secede. John Brown's actions at Harper's Ferry single-handedly pushed this nation over the cliff into the Civil War. So that's badass. Whether you agree with his actions or you disagree with his actions, he lived out loud, he died out loud, and he had an impact beyond his life. So tell me, do you think John Brown is a terrorist? Or is John Brown a martyr for the cause? And while you're at it, why don't you tell me who else you think I should cover in this series? Who's your favorite badass American? And make sure that you check out That Was History, the channel that's run by Cliff, the guy I was talking to before. Cliff and Jeremy put out amazing content, really great stuff, and you're going to want to check it out. You can subscribe to their page right there by clicking that little thumbnail, and that would be groovy. And we'll see you next time on the YouTubes when you're ready to do a little bit of the learning and stop it with all the cat videos. So giddy up. There we go, guys, where attention goes, energy flows. We'll see you next time. Giddy up. The conflict that he heralded, he looks down from heaven to view on the army.